Hi guys, welcome back to, uh, this is going to be uh, part eight of the uh, cruise ship stories, my early years. And this may be the last one for a while, okay, I'm kind of running out of stories, but i um, happy to answer questions and comments and also when we do live chats, I'll talk about things there as well. Um, I used to take out all of the, um, the big ships, Royal Caribbean and Carnival, when I was uh, an art director with Park West. And so whatever you know, newest, biggest ship came out, they would give it to me. And the reason was I was their top guy at the time. And so they gave me the Voyager of the Seas. And I went there and um, signed on the ship, beautiful ship. You ever been on the Voyager class ships? They're one of my favorite size of Royal Caribbean ships. They recreated Central Park all along the, uh, the main uh, thoroughfare there with the, the casinos there and um, the disco and all the shops. Even have a car parked, a little sports car parked. Like it's a road that they've recreated with buildings on the side and everything. You look up, you see the sky. At night you see stars. They have a, a big parade that takes place there a couple times during the cruise. It's really a beautiful ship. So anyway, I took over the ship and um, gave me a nice guest cabin. I think it was on like on deck six or seven, uh, inside cabin. And uh, things are going really well on the ship. I'd been there for about a week. You know, sales are great. And on those ships, they had the um, handy phones. You, if you've ever been on a cruise recently, you've probably seen this. It's like a cell phone, it's a small little cell phone. But it looked more like the analog phones of, say, the late 1990s, early 2000s than they do, like the, the modern, you know, smartphones that we have today. And these phones are a closed circuit system within the ship itself. So if you have one of these phones and they issue them to, <clears throat> department heads, um, even some of the like room stewards will have them because in case a, um, one of their passengers needs something or there's something wrong with the cab, they need, need to be able to get a hold of the steward quickly. <clears throat> so I had one of these phones. And um, I was in my cabin one night just chilling, you know, no work to do. It's like 9 or 10 o'clock at night and my phone rings. And it was uh, the staff captain, who's like, you know, second in charge on the ship, very powerful man. And he says, uh, you need to put on black now, dress in all black now, and come to the officer's bar now, get here soon. Hangs up. Uh, what the hell? I mean, what is going on? I mean, I thought somebody died or, you know, some kind of emergency. So I put on a black t-shirt, you know, black pair of, uh, pants and black shoes. And the officer's bar is a bar, there's a crew bar and there's a staff bar and then there's an officer bar which is on deck 10, the same level as a bridge. And it's only for two stripe officers and above. No one else can go there. <clears throat> and of course I was three stripes so I could go there. Anyway, I go to the bar and I get there and there's all these other staff members there and I notice that they're all new people. They're all people that had signed on within like the last week or two weeks like casino manager, gift shop manager, um, you know, a couple of officers, people like that. There was like maybe, I don't know, I'd say less than 20 of us in there. And in the officer's bar, they had pool tables. And on one of the pool tables was um, all these little shot glasses full of jello shots. I'd never done a jello shot in my life, but they're all full of jello shots. And they divide us up into groups. They say, okay, you, 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 you over here. And they line us all up and they divide us into groups. We had no choice. And there was four people per team. And they put us into groups and uh, they gave us a list. And what it was is a scavenger hunt. And they told us all these things that we had to go find around the ship. Like for example, Coke machine on deck, Coke machine on deck number, uh, you know, four or deck number two. Um, fire extinguisher, five, six, eight. Um, stairwell, nine, two, one. Um, poster on wall, things like that. And well, the way it worked was they would um, send us one thing, one thing at a time. Wait for a break here, hold on. Sorry, take a little break there. Um, so we had one thing at a time to do. 
to find. And so we go, we're, we're going all over the ship and trying to, remember we just signed on the ship and the Voyage was a big ship. And so you're trying to find a Coke machine on deck number four, you're r running all over the place, you know, in our groups. And we'd be down there and you'd have like maybe five minutes to find it. If you didn't find it within five minutes, they would call you on your handy phone, back to officer's bar now, back to officer's bar now. And you have to stop looking run we were literally running all over the ship through passengers areas and everything we get back to the officer's bar and we all had to do a jello shot you know so we do a jello shot and those that had it you know they got a point those that didn't got an x and then they give us the next thing to find and the next thing to find and so this lasted for like an hour and i think if you if you got the thing you didn't have to do the shot but if you didn't find it you had to do the shot and so we were all, you know, pretty trashed by the time the whole thing was over. And uh, it was all fun, you know, it was fun. And we, we thought like at first it was like an initiation thing, like, oh, let's get the new guys, you know, and get them drunk and run them around the ship and laugh at them. But I started thinking about it later. Encounter ship at any given time, there can be an emergency, a collision, a fire, any kind of thing can happen. And we're all trained. We're all trained with the emergency procedures. We all have specific duties. If something goes wrong, every single crew member has a specific duty that they have to do and they have to have it memorized, know how to do it. No matter how much pressure you're on, no matter what's going wrong, you do that duty. You go there and you do it. You don't even think about it. You know what you got to do. And so maybe you're, you know, maybe you're out partying the night before and you're a little hungover. Maybe, you know, even though you're not supposed to be, maybe you're drinking. Maybe, you know, you're asleep. You got to be ready to do anything. And the thing that was good about this, I, when I started thinking about when it was all over, when that scavenger hunt was over, even though I'd had like five or six jello shots, I knew that ship upside down. I knew places I didn't even know existed because they sent us everywhere. They sent us down in the engine room, they sent us up on the bridge, they sent us up on pool deck, they sent us all the crew areas. And we knew every place. And it was very, it was actually, Good training and very clever. I don't think they do that anymore. This was probably about 10 years ago, I guess, something like that. But, um, you know, I enjoyed it. I liked Royal Caribbean a lot. I liked working on those ships a lot. Um, next story on Celebrity. This is the first ship, first big ship that I was got to be cruise director on. I signed on that ship. I think I told a little bit of the story before, but I signed on that ship. My agent in New York got me on that ship with my um, ex-wife, who was my girlfriend at the time. They hired us together as a couple. She came on as a social hostess, and I came on as uh, just uh, assistant, cruise, assistant um, stage manager. And there was three stage managers, and that was it on that ship. Stage manager, two assistants. The two assistants um, were from New York. They'd done you know, off-Broadway, things like that, had a lot of credits university degree in technical theater, all that, which, as I've told you before in other videos, I don't have any of that. I just have experience. Anyway, those two guys lasted like about a month or two. They'd been there for a while anyway, and they left, and I saw I kept getting moved up the ladder. And so I was uh, production stage manager on the Horizon, which was the, um, you know, the nicest ship, you know. It was the flagship at the time of uh, Celebrity. Beautiful ship. It just got sent to Turkey last week to be scrapped. This was in like early 90s, 93, 94, something like that. Um, so I, uh, my agent calls me up in New York, because we were in New York like once a week, because we were sailing from Bermuda to New York, you know, one week cruises back and forth. And he calls me up and says, uh, or actually I called him, because back then we had pay phones, so I'd have to call him once a week. I called him, he said, hey Mark, you know, um, the ship's really happy with your work. They think you're doing a great job. And the hotel director thinks you would be a good um, deputy cruise director. That's like the second in command of the cruise director. Like you've got a staff captain, you've got a captain, staff captain. You've also got hotel director, assistant hotel director, and you've got um, cruise director, deputy cruise director. Deputy cruise director is kind of the guy who schedules all of the staff on board, the crew staff and the entertainers, musicians, all that. Also kind of the disciplinarian of all the crew staff, which is a whole nother thing. And uh, then does like the secondary shows like Pastor Talent Show, um, 
comedy shows, things like anything that's not in the main lounge except for the Pastor Talent Show. And uh, so I'd been on board for, I had the job for like one week. Remember, I'd been on, on the ship for like probably four months at this time before I got promoted. So I knew the ship and everything. And uh, I'd had the job, it was like my first week of being deputy cruise director. And staff captain, who was a Greek guy, not the nicest guy in the world, calls me on my radio and uh, says, come to my office right now, right now, get up here. Okay. It's in the morning, I go up to his office. And he's all pissed off. He's really mad. I said, you know, what's the problem? You know, like, he says, why did you uh, blow off going to, why did you go to the, uh, the makeup boat drill? I go, makeup boat drill, what's that? He goes, you don't know your own job. You don't know your own job. I said, I just took over this week and I didn't get a handover. Nobody's told me anything. You know, I know I'm in charge of half the, on the port side of the ship for, uh, for lifeboat drill and I've done my emergency duties, but nobody told me about a makeup light dr lifeboat drill. What is that? And it turns out that's when passengers who didn't make it to the ship um, on time for boat drill, which usually happens before we sail, or passengers who didn't show up for whatever reason to boat drill, um, they do a makeup drill in one of the secondary lounges and the assistant cruise director meets with these people. Or no, the, 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 one of the, um, the staff members, one of the dancers, meets with these people and shows them how to put on a life jacket, shows them how um, to do, um, you know, where the muster station is, all that stuff. And I'm supposed to schedule somebody to do that, okay? And in the uh, original schedule, it was already like on rotation with these dancers. They would take turns doing this makeup boat drill every cruise. And so it was already, you know, scheduled, but I didn't know anything about it. I wasn't supposed to actually do it. I was supposed to make sure somebody was there. And again, nobody tells me this, you know, because I took over in like a quick situation when I didn't get a handover from the person that I replaced. I don't even remember who I replaced. It's been so long ago. So what happened was, is 99% of the time, there is no makeup boat drill because everybody shows up on time and there's nobody late and everybody shows up so there, there's no need to have one. You only have to have one if if uh, somebody misses boat drill, a passenger. And the girls knew this, you know, they realized they'd go there, they'd go to the, the lounge already with their little uniform on and everything, and they'd have to sit there for 20 minutes and nobody would show up and they'd leave and go to their cabin. And they'd been doing that for months. And so this girl just decided, you know, well, nobody's gonna be there anyway, so I'm not gonna go. So she just slept in or whatever she did, she never showed up. And since I was her supervisor, I got the blame for it. And so I'm trying to, you know, I'm figuring all this out, you know, with him, he's screaming at me. And then and back then, I'm a much calmer person now, but, but when I was on ships for years, I used to carry with me what I called, we called my fuck you money. And if somebody was an asshole to me, especially a super, you know, captain, staff captain, hotel director, whatever, there were times when I just said, you know, fuck you, I went off the ship, I'm getting off tomorrow, I quit. A lot of times they would back down and apologize, we'd work it out, but sometimes I'd leave the ship. I got off one time in Djibouti in Africa when there's a war going on. That's another story. But um, I was that pissed off. And so I'm screaming at him, not screaming, I'm yelling at him in English. He's yelling at me in Greek. He's so mad he can't speak English anymore. And we go back and forth, you know, really not understanding what the other one is saying. And I storm out of his office and I slam the door. Okay, this is staff captain. You don't slam the door of staff captain. Um, he could have me off the ship like that. I mean, one, pick up his radio, make one phone call, I'm gone. You know, he could have done that. So um, it was formal night that night um, where the captain, staff captain, hotel, all the, all the, the, the big wigs all line up in front of the, um, the main show lounge and greet the guests as they go in for the captain's cocktail party. And as deputy cruise director, I had to be there along with the cruise director. And so I go down there <coughs> on time, got my tuxedo on and everything. And uh, everybody's there, staff captain, doctor, chief engineer, all of them. And uh, I'm there with the cruise director and 
Of course, nobody else knows what's happened between the two of us. Cruise director didn't know, hotel didn't, director didn't know, staff captain didn't know, I mean captain didn't know. And I see these officers, like the three of them, they're all, they're all sitting there like staff captain, chief engineer, and they're all like talking over there in Greek, you know, before the guests start lining up. I know they're talking about me, I just know it. Looking over at me like, you know, we're gonna get this guy, you know, we're gonna get this guy. And so I figure like, I've got some enemies on board. <clears throat> And, you know, not a good way to start your new contract, even though I've been on the ship for a while. So, um, nothing happens. He doesn't fire me. Doesn't write. He could have written me up a written warning, too. He could have done that. Nothing happens. And about two weeks later, I'm on the I-95. I think I told you most ships have, we call it the I-95 or the M1, whatever. It's the main corridor in the crew area that goes from the, the back of the ship to the front of the ship. And all the crew things are down there. You know, offices are down there. The crew mess is down there. Crew bars down there. You know, rec room. All kinds of stuff are down there for the crew. And it's also where they move the luggage from uh, one place to another when they're delivering that to the, to the cabins on the first day of cruise or taking it off the ship last day of cruise. And I'm walking down there, and I'm walking one way. I see staff captain coming the other way. It's just the two of us. I'm coming this way. He's coming that way. He sees me, I see him. We haven't really, we haven't spoken. We haven't really had any kind of, you know, contact at all. We've been in the same general area a couple of times, but that's it. He walks by me, goes, hi, Mark. I go, hi, Captain. And I keep going. <laughs> okay. Nothing happened. And then, like, maybe two weeks after that, we were in one of the islands. i trying to remember where it was. It might have been Nassau because we were overnight there. And I'm off the ship, you know, my time off, and I'm walking down the, uh, the, the uh, main port area there, heading into town, and there's a little bar there on the side. I see a staff captain sitting there. And he sees me, hey, Mark, come on over. I come over, and he says, oh, you want a drink? I said, yeah, sure, and he buys me a drink, and I, he has a drink, and we have a drink together, and like small talk, Never said a word about our argument, our big blow up, nothing. And that was it. That was the end of it. And I found out later that it's almost like a Greek thing. Because I've, I've dealt with Greeks before. I was on the Stella Solaris, which was a, a ship all owned by, owned by a Greek lady, Mrs. Kosogla. She owned three ships. All Greek officers, all Greek staff. And I was like the only American. I was the only American on the whole ship. There was a few other nationalities, but I was the only American. Um, and... Celebrity was all Greeks. And I found out that what they'll do sometimes when you're new on board, especially if you're a senior staff member, they want to test you. And they'll just fuck with you, you know. They'll do that, you know, give you a hard time about shit. And if you stand up to them, they respect you and they won't mess with you again. And that's, I think, what happened in this case. He respected me after that and, you know, I made sure that girl showed up every single time. I had a little talk with her. And uh, it never happened again, and we never had a problem again. But, you know, that's, that ships. I guess it's something that's almost like the military in some ways. Um, but that's that. Now let's jump to another place. I was on a ship, the, um, the Stella Solaris. Like I told you before, this is the, one of the ships that was owned by Mrs. Kosogola. And she was like the queen. Whenever we were in the Mediterranean, she'd come on board to see her ship. And all the senior staff would line up on the the dance floor there in the main show lounge. And she would go down the line and kiss each of us on the cheek. <laughs> Sometimes she'd give you a little gift. She's a sweet lady. And um, so I was on the Stella Solaris and we were on the Amazon. And my girlfriend and I, we were going from Rio to Manaus, which is like a thousand miles up the Amazon River. And we got off the ship like halfway up in a little tiny village somewhere. And I saw this little food stand, you know, like food court set up there, you know, plastic chairs and stuff under the shade, and a signed pizza. I go, wow, Jill, I haven't had pizza in forever. Let's get a pizza. She goes, okay. So we go over there. And I remember they had these beers. I think it was called Arctica. And they were the big bottles, you know, like the, the pint bottles of beer, you know. And they were so cold that steam would come off of them. And if you're in the hot Amazon jungle, I mean, nothing like a nice cold beer. And so we got a beer to share, and pizza came, looked fine. I had a piece, 
chili had a piece. Went to get the th third piece, you know, it's had a little, you know, the spatula lifted up, and there's a, a big cockroach. I mean, a big one, like, you know, that big, cooked underneath the pizza. Like, I guess he'd been on the dough or on the pizza pan or whatever, but he'd been cooked completely on that third slice of pizza there. And in the Amazon, we've been down there for a long time, like almost six months. And so there's bugs everywhere. And the Amazon is like, you know, alive. And we were so used to bugs being around us and on us and everywhere that we just took that piece of pizza, we put it aside, and we ate the other rest of the pizza. And we didn't even complain because <laughs> we'd been down there for so long. It's just a bug. They're everywhere. And so that's my pizza story. Um, I was going to talk about charters. How far in are we here? Let's see. I don't want to go too long. Um, I've done a lot of charters over the years, different ships where the entire ship is chartered by a group or a company. And one charter I did, I'm not going to say the name of the cruise line. One charter I did was a nude, a nude cruise. And uh, all nudists. And uh, what happened was the, a lot of the crew would be offended by, by nudity. And so I think there was a lot of Muslims who signed off for like a week while we're doing that cruise. And the passengers, they had a rule, like once we sailed away for like, I think we were like five miles out or something, they made an announcement, it was okay for the, the guests to get comfortable, I think they called it. And they did, they all took their clothes off. And if you've ever been to a nudist uh, beach, a nude beach, or a nudist colony, or anything nude, it's, it's never the people that you want to see nude. <laughs> it's not supermodels. It's not Adonis. You know, it's old guys like me, or old women, or, you know, f people that are, are not all that attractive, walking around nude. And uh, the funny thing is, they walk around like, nothing's unusual, like nothing's wrong, you know. They'll have a conversation with you. Hi, how are you doing, Mark? Nice to see you. Did you enjoy the port today? Yeah, sure, it's fine. And you're trying to look them in the face, you know, and not look down at their body. And the rule was, wherever they went, they had to sit on a napkin, you know, like a cloth napkin from the dining room. So they'd, they'd go around the ship with their napkin, they'd lay it down and sit on it. And it was weird, very weird. But um, that was a new cruise. And then I did a Japanese charter for Amway. And this was on Sea Goddess, the same ship that Donald Trump came on board, the same ship that Leona Helmsley was on board. And if you know anything about Amway, it's almost like a pyramid sales type thing. Been around forever. And the way you make money at it is you've got to get your friends to get involved and get them to sell stuff and get them to get their friends involved. And then you get a little bit of everybody's money. And the double diamonds were the ones, the most successful of all the the Japanese Amway people. And they were on board the ship along with the owner of Amway and his immediate family. And uh, Amway's a huge company. They had two Los Angeles retired police officers as bodyguards that went everywhere with the family. They even watched their food being made. If their meals were being cooked in the dining room, they were there watching them make the food. And uh, I remember one day uh, I was talking, because the, the, the guards were really nice guys, you know, they're just in civilian clothes. And I was talking to one of them, and one of the members of the family, a young woman, maybe 35, 40 years old, came walking by with a stroller and a little baby in it. He said, you see that baby? I said, yes, that baby's worth $100 million. Wow. But um, they're all Japanese, and they had an interpreter. And so the Amway people were Americans, but the, the Japanese were the, the double diamonds, you know, from Japan. I guess they got them from different countries. So anyways, I would be up on, I remember we had a pool party and had entertainment. I'd get up and I'd do a, a speech, you know, and I'd talk about what's coming up as far as entertainment, the next ports we're going to, all that stuff. And I have the interpreter right next to me, a Japanese lady. And she's got a microphone, I've got a microphone. And so I'd say like a paragraph and then pause and she would translate into Japanese. And it was really weird because I would get up there. I'm used to everybody paying attention to me when I'm on stage with a microphone. I'd start talking 
and I'd do my paragraph, and then they would just ignore me like I was a ghost, like I was invisible. And then she'd start translating, they would all stop what they were doing, look around, and pay direct attention to her, and then she'd stop, and I'd start talking, they would ignore me. And it kept going like that, but that was the Japanese charter. Um, I did one other cruise that was a, um, I did two other, I'll tell you three more charters. Did the tall person's cruise. I'm six foot four, by the way. And we did a tall person's cruise. And it was on a carnival ship. And all the people were like, got seven feet up, it seemed like. There was one guy that had to be eight feet tall. I felt like, um, what's the little guy from Taxi's name? Danny DeVito. I felt like him walking around that ship because I was looking up at everybody. I mean, women that were seven feet tall. It was just bizarre, like being on another planet or something. And I felt sorry for these people because as a tall person myself, when I travel and I'm on a plane, it's hard to get comfortable. And I can't imagine how they even got there. I was thinking, how did these people get here? How would you even get on an airplane if you're that big? And I think a lot of them had a, a thyroid problem because their eyes were, some of their eyes were bugged out a little bit or pushed out and it had something to do with their thyroids that they just kept growing. Uh, but yeah, I felt sorry for them. And then I did a Rosie O'Donnell cruise, which were all lesbians. And they just were not happy. They were just, they were just angry. They weren't, uh, they weren't friendly to the staff. They complained about a lot of things. And no matter what we could do, we, couldn't, we just couldn't make them happy. And uh, it's just, it just, the whole cruise just did not go well. Didn't go well at all, I remember that. And I met her and you know, she was polite to me. I, I didn't, uh, you know, dislike her or anything. I just, uh, she was very businesslike, put it that way, it was all business, everything was business. And I've done several of these gay charters where they were, I think Atlantis was a company in Florida that charters them. They, too, they chartered the biggest ships in Royal Caribbean to do these gay charters. And the gay charters are just a blast because they have such a good time. They bring on their own entertainment. They spend a ton of money. I mean, everywhere, the gift shops, the casino, the art auctions. Like I was doing art auctions the last time I was there. And on average auction, or actually av average cruise on that ship, we do like say $40,000 in art sales. During the gay charter, we did 400,000. Give you some idea. Um, let's see, but I think that's pretty much it for charters. That's it for this video. I'm kind of uh, running out of stories, so I may start uh, a new series of things that happened to me when I was younger. I had uh, kind of a rough teenage years, and I might go into some of that detail. Let me know if you're interested in hearing any of that. I used to like hitchhike to Florida and stuff and some wild things. But uh, thanks a lot for watching, everybody. I really appreciate it. Um, please check out uh, my girlfriend's channel, Every Woman Has a Story. Uh, some of you have asked me, the girls especially, the ladies have asked me to do, to interview women on my channel. And that's really not my thing. I, I want to kind of focus on interviewing guys my age and what their lives are like and why they came here. But Jen isn't doing exactly what she wanted to do. She's going to be interviewing women of all ages in the Philippines and find out, you know, in depth what their lives are like uh, growing up in the Philippines, um, you know, their hopes and dreams, all that stuff. And I think you'll really enjoy it. So, um, so check that out. It's Every Woman Has a Story. Thanks again for watching. I'll be doing another live stream sometime this week. Hope to see you all there. Um, any comments or questions you've got or things you'd like for me to do or question or people you'd like for me to interview, let me know. I'm not going to be doing budgets and what it costs to live in the Philippines and visas. You know, there's too many other guys doing that stuff. I'm just trying to find interesting characters and uh, interview them and, and tell my story. So thanks a lot for watching, guys. Thanks for subscribing and stay safe. Bye.